My name is Michael Prelutsky, President and CEO of Georgia City Medical Center. Before we begin with our panel, I'd like to take a few moments to talk to you about how Georgia City Medical Center is healing, enhancing, and investing in Hudson County. We're expanding the medical center right here on campus. If you come visit, you'll see major construction as we increase the size of our emergency room and our operating rooms. We're also investing and expanding right next to you. We're building more primary care offices and more specialty offices in your neighborhood, so it's easier for you to reach our excellent physicians. Certainly as it relates to maternity, we're also doubling the size of our center of excellence right there on Grove Street next to the PATH train station. That will open, the new facility will open in a few weeks. In the meantime, the existing facility is also fully open. And of course, early this year, we opened a brand new, beautiful Lord Abbott Maternity Wing with 20 private rooms, great views of Statue of Liberty even today, and fantastic amenities for your partner with the opportunity to sleep right there in the room, and of course, food service. Before we move to our panel discussion and your questions, I will say that during the height of the pandemic and Hudson County got hit pretty hard, Jersey City Medical Center continued to provide maternity services. In fact, when other hospitals in the county shut down their, their maternity services, some, some forever really, we continued to service this county fully. We took care of hundreds of non-COVID patients, and yes, we had took care of a number of COVID patients as well. But all those COVID, non-COVID patients received the highest quality of care, and those babies, those families went home happy and healthy. Indeed, Jersey City Medical Center's Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and, and Women's Health is state-designated regional perinatal center and is the sole level three NICU, regional neonatal intensive care unit for Hudson County. Over the last five years, we delivered over 10,000 babies 1,500 of those, of those babies, the most vulnerable ones, received care in our NICU, level three NICU, getting the highest possible level of care in this county. And of course, early in 2019, we delivered quintuplets, a great feat and really a unique service right here in the county. And those quintuplets went home happy and healthy. So with that, let me now move to our panelists and introduce them to you. First, Dr. Lance Brook, Chairman, Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Women's Health, and Dr. Barack Razan, Director for Maternal Field of Medicine for Georgia City Medical Center and Hudson County. So with these two great experts joining us tonight, let me now, without any additional delay, move to your questions. And I'll read them out loud as we receive them, hopefully answering all those questions. And of course, if we don't, you'll have an opportunity to reach out to us and ask additional questions later on. So Dr. Brock, uh, first uh, several questions are to you. Quote, how is labor and delivery handling COVID-19? Thanks, Michael. Uh, before I answer the question, I would like to just give a little bit of background information. So the pandemic's been with us for over five months. The information regarding managing coronavirus and COVID-19 continues to change and certainly continues to change related to pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Rosen and I uh, will be answering questions and we're going to try to use guidelines from both the American College of OBGYN, from the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine and the CDC to really give you current updates uh, on how and what are the best practices for managing um, your care during your pregnancy. During the height of the pandemic, uh, which really was April, we were universally testing all of the patients admitted to labor and delivery. The positive rate during that peak time was 20% of the patients and 62% of those patients actually were asymptomatic. The good news as in New Jersey, as the numbers have decreased dramatically, we are still seeing very few patients today uh, that are positive. Regardless, when patients are admitted to labor and delivery today, um, all patients and their significant others are required to wear a mask. Um, our full team is wearing uh, PPE, which is their personal protective equipment, and that varies depending on whether the patient um, tests positive or is negative. And we have uh, very sophisticated protocols in place if indeed a mom does test positive to protect um, the mom, to protect the staff, to protect the significant other, and, and to protect uh, the uh, pending newborn. Thank you. 
Next question uh, to you as well. Um, how many support people can be in the room? Doulas, are women and support partners required to wear masks? So currently today, and, and obviously this has changed from the peak of the um, pandemic when most of the hospitals in the tri-state area were not allowing any visitors into the hospital. But currently, and this has been in place now uh, probably for the last two months, we are allowing the significant other to be with um, the patient during their uh, time with us. And we also are now allowing uh, doulas to um, also join uh, to add in the birthing process. Uh, we do ask that everyone that comes into the hospital is wearing a mask at all times during that stay. Um, that is a requirement of anyone who is currently in the hospital, all patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brock, uh, staying with you, uh, should the mother and birthing partner quarantine for two weeks before projected due date? So it's a really interesting question. Uh, I don't think there's any mandates uh, around that. However, it's not required, but I would say, you know, it probably would be best practice. I mean, I think that, you know, isolating yourself before coming into the hospital to the best of your ability and would decrease the chances of being exposed to uh, the coronavirus. And, and certainly if we're able to do that, uh, that would be best practice. Thank you. Uh, last question to you for now. Uh, what extra steps should be taken to protect you and your baby from getting COVID-19? Again, I'm reading it, uh, so it's a quote from an uh, expected mom. What extra steps should be taken to protect you and your baby from getting COVID-19? So just recently, all of the chairs in New Jersey, we actually put together a, a statement that we sent out to elected officials in, in New Jersey, and, and really it emphasized what we know does work. And, and it is social distancing, wearing a mask, um, and hand washing. So certainly, uh, you know, it sort of goes along with the second, uh, the prior question about quarantining. Really best practice when you're not in the hospital is to keep your distance from others, minimize contact um, with people outside of your immediate family, wear a mask at all times, and, and wash your hands. Um, certainly when you're in any kind of public space. That, that really is the best way um, to protect yourself. Thank you, Dr. Brock. Uh, Dr. Razen, uh, thank you for uh, waiting patiently and thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, this question is to you. What is the risk to pregnant women and the baby if they get COVID-19? Uh, thank you for that question, Michael, and good evening to all our viewers. Um, at the beginning of this pandemic, there was actually quite a bit of concern that pregnant women would be affected more severely than non-pregnant women or men. And the reason for this concern is our experience with other respiratory viral diseases where we observe that pregnant women do get sicker than non-pregnant women and have a higher risk of having severe disease. Uh, for instance, in the 2012 H1N1 pandemic, the rate of maternal death was actually five times higher than in non-pregnant women. So obviously, uh, the community was very concerned about the possibility that the COVID-19 pandemic will affect pregnant women uh, in a more severe manner. But fortunately, that hasn't really happened. Uh, there have been numerous studies that have come out over the last few months uh, it, although they are small studies, but they pointed to the fact that pregnant women were not more likely to get infected and not more likely to get infected severely. So that was certainly very reassuring. And also reassuring is the fact that the majority of pregnant women that do get COVID-19 actually are either asymptomatic or have very mild disease. Um, a little spoiler to that statement is a recent report from the CDC that came out a few weeks ago and examined uh, data on some 8,000 pregnant women compared them to non-pregnant women, non -pregnant women. And in that data, it was shown that the risk of pregnant women to be admitted to the ICU is actually 50% higher than in their counterparts. And their risk of requiring mechanical ventilation to be on a ventilator 
was about 70% higher. Uh, but on the reassuring side, the actual number of women was very low. Only one and a half percent of women were admitted to the ICU. Only one half percent, one in 200 women required ventilation. And the death rate was no different in the pregnant women that it was in the non-pregnant women. A very low death rate, one in 500 women. So overall, the data is quite reassuring for pregnant women. Um, the risk for the pregnant women is, of course, only in those women, or primarily, I'd say, in those women that do get severe disease. The minority that do get severe disease, that need to go on a ventilator, that have their lungs and their cardiac function severely affected. And of course, this can also uh, indirectly affect the fetus as well. And in these women that are severely ill, there's a higher risk of preterm delivery. There's a very high risk of C-section, of course, if they do not manage to maintain an adequate level of oxygen in the blood, that can affect the baby. But again, fortunately, that is a very small minority of women. So the bottom line is quite reassuring for pregnant women. Thank you for the comprehensive answer. Um, staying with you, uh, one more question, please. Uh, at what point during pregnancy would you be more susceptible to an adverse outcome if one were to contract uh, COVID-19? So again, there's very little data with which to answer this specific question. Um, it doesn't seem that women are more susceptible to be infected at one stage of the pregnancy versus another. But obviously in the latter stages of pregnancy, when they are in their third trimester, uh, if they do get severe disease, the effect could be more pronounced. Uh, because they now have a large uterus that is pushing on the diaphragm and to some degree impeding the ability of the lung to function. Uh, as you know, probably uh, women that have severe disease may have to be treated by laying them on their belly. And obviously that's more difficult with pregnant women. So overall, if you look at it, it makes sense that it's less desirable to get the COVID-19 infection in the third trimester than it is in the first or second trimester. But again, there's really very little data with which to address this question accurately. Thank you. Um, this question, uh, Dr. Rosanne, is to you as well as, as an expert in uh, high-risk pregnancies. Uh, if my pregnancy is considered high-risk, am I at higher risk for contracting COVID-19? Um, let's, let's start there, please. Uh, first of all, the term high risk is very general. Uh, there's a high risk pregnancy that could be high risk because there's a problem with a fetus, let's say a malformation or it's not growing well. But uh, with respect to this specific question, the high risk will probably be referring to the mother's situation. And when we have a mother with a background disease, let's say she has hypertension or she has diabetes, or she has a disease like lupus, or if she has a renal disease, these are risk factors for people in general when they get COVID-19. It's not a risk factor for contracting COVID-19, but if she does contract COVID-19, these underlying background risk factors will place her at higher risk for getting severe disease. So to the extent that she has one of these background diseases, certainly these women do have to adopt uh, even more precautions to protect themselves from getting COVID-19 because it does indeed have the potential to put them in the category of severe disease. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brock, uh, back to you, please. Uh, uh, quote, does the mother and support partner receive COVID-19 testing? Uh, what type of testing? How long does it take to get the results? Thanks, Michael. So uh, as everyone I think knows when you uh, turn on the news, you know, the testing um, and the availability of testing continues to change nationally and regionally in the country as more and more cases have been reported. Uh, thankfully, not in New Jersey, but certainly in the majority of the states in the United States. Uh, currently um, at RWJ Barnabas and at Jersey City Medical Center, uh, we are testing, as I mentioned earlier, all mothers who are admitted to labor and delivery. 
Uh, we were one of the first hospitals to start doing that back in April, and we continue to do it. Uh, the mother has what's called a PCR test, which is the nasal swab test, and the results of that test come back in 12 hours generally. We do have a uh, rapid test, which uh, unfortunately the ability and, and supply of the kits to run that uh, particular test are limited nationally. Um, but we, when we do need to run a rapid test, that test result is back in one hour. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Razan, back to you. Uh, can COVID-19 be transferred from mother to the baby? If so, what are the complications? Uh, so uh, there are two ways that the virus can be transmitted from the mother to the baby. Uh, I'll first address the simple way, like after birth, if a mother has COVID-19, of course she can transmit it through contact with the baby. And obviously these mothers that are infected have to adopt precautions so as not to transmit it. But I think the question probably relates to the possibility of uh, transmitting the virus, what we call vertical transmission meaning transmitting it during pregnancy through the placenta or during delivery. So there is some conflicting data regarding this. Uh, most of the data points to the fact that most likely the uh, likelihood of transmitting the virus during pregnancy uh, is very low. It's probably not zero, but it is very low. The vast majority of women that have COVID-19 do not transmit the virus from themselves to the baby. And that's because the incidence of viremia, meaning the presence of the virus in the bloodstream is very low. Therefore, it doesn't reach the placenta and doesn't cross the placenta and reach the baby. But having said that, there are a few case reports about babies being born with proof of an infection. And there are some other case reports with suggestion that they may have gotten the infection while in the uterus, but not actual proof. Uh, once again, the encouraging news is that even in those babies that are born with proof of infection, the outcome of the babies is good. So generally speaking, even though there might be the possibility of transmission, it likely does not affect the babies significantly. Great. Probably related to uh, Dr. Rosanne, uh, staying with you, a uh, related question. Are antibodies passed from mother to babies if mom tested positive for COVID-19? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, just a little bit of a preface. There are two types of antibodies. When someone gets infected with a disease, including a virus, the body first uh, creates antibodies called IgM antibodies, immunoglobulin M. These antibodies are quite large molecules and they generally do not cross the placenta. Uh, in a second stage, uh, and it depends on the virus or on the bacteria after a few days or after a week or two, the body produces immunoglobulins of the IgG type. Now, these are smaller molecules that do cross the placenta. So they do cross the placenta, and in various diseases, they actually do provide protection to the fetus from infection. So in babies born to mothers with COVID infection, they have found IgG antibodies in their bloodstream. And interestingly, there are some cases where they actually found IgM antibodies and nobody's quite sure how these IgM antibodies actually crossed over to the baby. But even though we have proof of presence of these antibodies, we don't really know to what extent these antibodies do provide protection for the newborn baby. Just as we don't know in grownups that have the infection and have had antibodies to what extent, extent these antibodies provide in protection, the same thing with babies. But it's certainly interesting and encouraging to know that these antibodies do cross over to the baby. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Brock, uh, back to you. Um, if a mother is COVID-19 positive, is there a golden hour for skin to skin or is she separated from the baby immediately? So our goal um, is always to make sure that a newborn is spending as much time with, with mom as possible. Uh, despite coronavirus, we're really trying to continue to run our operation as normal as we possibly can. 
we feel that it's extremely important that moms are able to bond immediately with their newborns. And we certainly continue to encourage that. Obviously, during the pandemic, it really is a case by case basis, particularly if a mom is positive. We still encourage it. We do recommend that mom is wearing a mask, is hand washing when handling the baby. Um, but there could be cases, and thankfully, we really have not seen any women at Jersey City Medical Center who were severely ill, but certainly on a case by case basis, if a mom was unfortunate and was extremely ill, we wouldn't be able to do that skin to skin contact. But for the vast, vast majority of our patients, even in the height of the pandemic and currently, we are encouraging that skin to skin contact. Um, and that's what anyone who comes to Jersey City should expect. Thank you. Dr. Razan, uh, back to you. Uh, can COVID-19 positive mothers breastfeed? Uh, thank you for that question, because it's a question that really uh, arises uh, in many, many women that have delivered because it's of such interest to them. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, pregnant women that are infected with COVID-19 can breastfeed. And like anything in medicine, uh, we have to weigh the risks and the benefits uh, in this situation. So the benefits of breastfeeding are very well known and are numerous, both for the baby and for the mother. And let, let's examine what the risks are. The risks are that the baby will get infected. So the risk is actually pretty low. And it's low because the mothers can adopt protective uh, steps to protect the baby from being infected. They can, they have to wear a mask, they have to wash their hands, they have to wash their breast and the nipple. And that way the baby will be protected to a great degree from being infected. And actually, even if the baby is infected, we know that the chance of a baby of getting severe disease is very, very low. So whatever way you look at it, it's quite a safe step to take to breastfeed. And there's actually been a study that was, uh, performed in New York City, where they published data on 82 women who were infected with COVID-19, and they roomed in with the babies, and they breastfed them, and these babies were followed, and actually none of them got infected. So the bottom line is that breastfeeding is very safe for the mother, providing that she adopts the desired measures to protect the baby. There might actually be an advantage in breastfeeding because we know that antibodies do appear in the breast milk. So these antibodies, to the extent that they might protect the baby, may protect the baby additionally from getting COVID-19. Um, another option for mothers who don't want to breastfeed, that are afraid of having the baby get infected, is to pump the milk and let someone else feed the baby with the breast milk. So again, if they choose that venue and they pump milk into a breast pump, they have to clean the pump according to the guidelines of the manufacturer. They have to wash their hands very well before they perform the pumping. They have to wash the breast, and that's another option for them. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brock, uh, this question is to you. Um, I'm scheduled for a C-section, and just to remind you, I'm still reading the question. So to quote, I'm scheduled for a C-section. Is there anything additional I need to know uh, since we are dealing with COVID and the pandemic? So for any patient who has a scheduled cesarean schedule, uh, they will receive a call um, from our uh, clerical person uh, scheduling them to visit our pre-admissions testing unit 48 to 72 hours before their scheduled uh, cesarean. During this time, routine blood work will be drawn and as well as the PCR uh, COVID-19 test. So when you arrive on the day of your scheduled cesarean, your test results will already be back, your blood results will be back, and it will smooth the process of getting admitted and having your delivery. Thank you. Staying, uh, staying with you, Dr. Brock, um, next question. Uh, after delivering my baby, how long should I expect to stay in the hospital for a vaginal delivery or a C-section? 
So as you mentioned earlier, Michael, um, our new Lord Abbott maternity wing opened in January of this year. So all of our patients during the pandemic were fortunate in that they were able to have a private room um, after they delivered. Uh, this gives us a lot of benefits um, and certainly not sharing a room with someone who might potentially um, have the virus. So everyone has been in a private room um, during, during the five months of the pandemic. During the height of the pandemic, we were encouraging our patients who had a vaginal delivery to go home um, if they were well in one day and our cesareans in two days. And sort of the idea when the burden of disease in the hospital was so large, we thought it was probably best to get patients out of the hospital as quickly as possible. Um, as the numbers have dramatically dropped over the last few months, uh, we're now moving back into our uh, normal pattern, which would be a vaginal delivery without any complications would stay in the hospital two days. Uh, patient after cesarean would stay typically three days, but certainly for patients who are feeling well and don't feel comfortable staying in the hospital, uh, being able to be discharged earlier will, will not be a problem at all. Thank you. Uh, Speaking of staying in the hospital, Dr. Burke, let's stay with you uh, with this question. Uh, what are the visitation guidelines for maternity labor and delivery units? So as, as mentioned earlier, you know, during the height of the pandemic, we had absolutely no visitors and, and that was extremely difficult um, for all patients uh, that had to go through that. We, we certainly have backed off of that. Um, and currently, we are allowing the significant other of the patient to be with them um, from admission throughout the pregnancy. Um, and recently, we also have loosened the restrictions and we are now allowing patients who choose to have a doula, have that doula uh, be with them during the pregnancy. Uh, we still would like either the significant other and or the doula, if they are going to come into the hospital, that they stay with the patient uh, during the in court entire stay of the hospital. We don't want people going in and out of the hospital because we're trying to continue to um, minimize potential exposure to all patients um, during, the, during the hospitalization. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Brock, uh, last question for you, please. Uh, can my partner leave the hospital to get food or have food delivered? Will the cafeteria be open to purchase meals? So, so the... the one of the perks of, of the new Lord Abbott maternity wing and, and the private room is that we do feed the patient and their significant other. Our cafeteria uh, does remain open. Uh, during the pandemic, we moved to serving prepackaged food to obviously reduce exposure to anyone who chooses to use the cafeteria, and that is an option. And we are allowing uh, deliveries to the hospital and significant other can go down to the lobby uh, to pick up food, and very often our, our staff um, will actually go down and bring the food up for patients. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Razan, uh, last question to you. What extra steps should be taken to care for a newborn during COVID-19? Thank you for the question. Um, so even though we know that uh, infants and children in general are very unlikely to get severe disease if they get infected, it is still possible to have severe disease. And there are some case reports on newborn infants that were infected with COVID-19 and were severely ill. So every measure has to be adopted to protect the baby from being infected. And as you know, babies like to be held by numerous people and lifted and fed and all the relatives come to visit. So it's really important to insist on keeping to those measures. Anybody that touches the baby has to be masked, has to wash their hands before they touch the baby, uh, especially with children. If there are siblings in the house, you know, it's gonna be very difficult to keep them away from the baby and from touching. And children, uh, we know, can be carriers of COVID-19 without showing any symptoms. So it's really important to insist on all these measures of masking, washing the hands, keeping the baby protected, and safeguard the health of the baby. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. So with this, we do come to an end uh, of the questions we did receive. As I mentioned, uh, 
to all our viewers, uh, please feel free to go online and drop us a, long, a question if you have any. We'll uh, respond very quickly. Uh, but as we close out, I'd like to have Dr. Brock View first uh, uh, provide some comments to our audience. Thanks, Michael. So first, I'd like to thank the members of the community who uh, tuned in this evening for this session. Um, you know, as an acute care hospital, we obviously take care of sick patients when they come into the hospital. However, the Department of OBGYN and Women's Health, we really see a, you know, we play a vital role in also educating the community. And this is certainly one way that we are able to do that. Uh, on behalf of the labor and delivery, our maternity team, our NICU team, we are really proud to serve the community of Jersey City and the greater Hudson County. We are prepared to handle the care of this community, despite whatever uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 may throw at us. And you should have confidence that if you come into the hospital, you will get the highest level of care. Our entire team has been here throughout the pandemic. We've had terrific outcomes uh, related to even our patients who have had the virus. Um, as, as Dr. Rosen said, we, you know, our, our moms and our babies have been discharged home, I think feeling very comfortable with the care that they've received. So in conclusion, we're here for you. We strive in everything that we do to make the experience positive, and we want to make sure that you're safe at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rosen, uh, parting comments from you, please. Um, so these are definitely unprecedented times, and there's no question that these unprecedented times create anxiety in the pregnant woman, in her spouse, in her family, in addition to the common anxieties that are related to pregnancy. So I want to echo Dr. Brock's words and reassure all these pregnant women that we are here to safeguard their health, to safeguard the health of their unborn and born babies, and to provide the best care that we can in Jersey City Medical Center. And we have all the means to provide that care to the benefit of our patients. Thank you. And again, thank you both for taking the time uh, tonight uh, during the storm uh, to join us and to provide those insightful comments uh, to our audience. I'm sure it's uh, very helpful to address, uh, again, the anxiety that uh, you mentioned. Um, as far as uh, I'm concerned, uh, we are certainly blessed uh, to have experts such as yourself uh, at Georgia City Medical Center servicing uh, Hudson County population. Certainly your team, your clinical team is outstanding. Our nursing team, uh, our midwives, uh, our anesthesiologists, really, uh, truly a great team. And uh, the team that provided amazing service uh, during the height of the pandemic and certainly continues to do so now. Uh, it is wonderful to talk about uh, the great facilities that we've built, the Lord Abbott Maternity Wing, the new ambulatory center, the outpatient offices we've created. Uh, all that's great, but obviously the clinical expertise that uh, takes care of the of the moms that come uh, to us is paramount, and uh, very happy to uh, to highlight uh, that it is uh, it is at uh, at the top of the art of medicine. So again, uh, thank you both uh, for joining us. Uh, to our audience, uh, thank you as well. And again, feel free to reach out to us online, uh, drop us a note, uh, and certainly if you'd like to tour of our facilities. If you uh, would like to step by and arrange for that, it's available. Uh, Lord Abbott Wing is uh, is open, fully operational. And uh, with that, uh, continue to stay safe, continue to wear masks and wash hands, and good night. <laughs>